and keep admitting you just for a minute. Alrighty, welcome to Avid Reader Online. Um, and thank you for joining us on Zoom this evening for a discussion of Seven and a Half by Christos Chalkas. I actually should that say that in my best Greek accent. <laughs> you, did, Greek. Man, you did. <laughs> Christos Tsiolkas. <laughs> Um, before we jump into things, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently on in Mianjin, which is the Yogara and Turrbal people, um, as well as the traditional owners of the land from which you're all joining us from across the country via Zoom. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, for our audience tonight, you will be muted for the session, but if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I'll get onto those. Um, you are welcome to leave your video on if you'd like. Um, and just lastly, if you click up in the top corner where it says view, uh, just make sure you're set to speak of you. That way you'll be able to see Christos and Chrissy um, in full screen. And I'm about to send you through a link of where you can purchase your copy of the book. Um, I'll pop this into the chat box um, and this will show you how to use the chat box function, which will be very important for our Q&A session um, towards the end at around 7.20. But please feel free to type your questions throughout and then I'll pass them along to Christos uh, towards the end. Next, I'd love to introduce you um, to our conversation partner for tonight, our very own Chrissy Neen. Chrissy is the author of eight works of fiction, memoir and poetry, including the Thomas Shapcott award-winning Eating My Grandmother and the Stella Prize shortlisted An Uncertain Grace. Her latest book is the memoir, The Three Burials of Lottie Neen. Over to you, Chrissy. Thanks, Yana. So fantastic to be here tonight with Christos Chalkas, who is the author of short stories, nonfiction, and seven novels, including the prize winning book Dead Europe. His fourth novel, novel and international bestseller, The Slap, won overall best book in the Commonwealth Writers Prize in 2009 and was shortlisted for the 2009 Miles Franklin Award. Long listed for the 2010 Man Booker Prize. Now, that's something they can't take away from you ever. Ever, Christos, <laughs> and um, won the Australian Lit Literary Society Gold, as well as the 2009 Australian Booksellers Association and Australian Book Industry Awards Book of the Year. So many prizes for the slap. Uh, Christos's fifth novel, Barracuda, was shortlisted for the ALS Gold Medal and the inaugural Voss Literary Prize. The Slap and Barracuda were both adapted into celebrated television series and Christos's sixth novel, Damascus, was published in 2019 and won the 2019 Victoria Premier's Literary Award for Fiction. He's also a playwright, essayist and screenwriter. And in fact, I think there was a short film that you were co-writer on that was recently at the Brisbane International Film Festival. It was, it was not a short film, it was a feature called oh. Little Tornadoes uh, by a wonderful director, Aaron Wilson. And he brought me along uh, to do some co-writing on, on it. And it's been, uh, it was a wonderful experience, Chrissy. It's a film set in rural Victoria in the 70s and kind of looking at the, the changes both from feminism and also from the migrant world coming into those communities. I, I really, I, I have all the love in the world for that man. It was a, a I am so thing. going to um, track that down. I wasn't in um, Brisbane when that was on, so I missed it, but I'm going to track that one down. But this book, um, which I will hold up for you now, Seven and a Half, is like no other book you will read this year or any other year. It's a playful, naughty and exuberant book uh, with a man called Christos um, who goes away on a writing retreat to write his next novel, a book about an ex-porn star who is offered a generous sum of money to spend a few days with an older admirer. Christos, the writer, spends much time walking the beaches, swimming and immersing himself in nature, and he gathers the energy and the impetus to write through the pages of the book. Uh, he cuts himself off from his partner and the news of the world, blind to the fact that something is sweeping across Australia and the world as he struggles with characters, plot, themes of the book. So this is a book about beauty, about life, about lust, and most important, about writing. 
Uh, that's why I particularly loved this book and that's why um, I was particularly drawn to um, doing this conversation with Christos because as a writer I feel like this is a book for every writer out there um, that you will really understand um, some of the, the, the great moments of the book where things come together for Christos the writer in the book and probably for Christos the writer in real life as well. <laughs> Coming to those moments, it's hard to untangle actually what is Christos from the book and Christos from the writerly world writing the book sometimes. For me, it's, it's tricky to untangle those things. Was that a tricky untangling act for you? It, it is, uh, you know, the, there was a period, there was a, a small moment, it was only a very small moment where I thought of not making the narrator Christos, but I didn't want to do that. And I, I guess what I wanted to do, so usually what happens with your novels or with fiction is that people are searching for the autobiography in the fiction. That was a very generous introduction, Chrissy, and I thank you for it. And I, I guess that was part of the play for me of Seven and a Half is to reverse that and to, and to maybe ask the reader to think about the fiction in autobiography. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, that, we, that everything we, you know, what we do as writers, what we do with our imagination, what we do with our craft is it, it all those things are in play, whatever kind of writing we do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I think um, it would be great for our audience to get a little taste of that. Um, you've chosen a little bit from the beginning of the book um, yeah. and maybe you can read that. Yeah, because this is where the writer kind of declares something about what they're wanting to do. It is treacherous being a writer. It would be so much more simple and desirable to be a musician or even a painter. The abstract is essential to the former and liberating for the latter. With writing, with words, one is always bound to language and to the imperative for language in the Western and European consciousness to extol progress and to endorse teleology and to revere reason. Even now I feel an imperative for declaration and revelation. Before I can begin my work, I must confess my apostasy. So here goes. I'm suspicious of the homogenizing effect of globalization and, and cosmopolitanism. And I suspect that ingrained in every manifestation of those worldviews is a rapacious greed for the material over the spiritual. I wish to be, and I so try to be, a universalist in every human exchange. Yet what I truly long for is the specific and the local. In essence, I am egalitarian in my hopes and conservative when it comes to the immutability of human nature. I think the right wing's cataclysmic failure has been its entanglement with the vilest and voracious dogma and the equally cataclysmic failure of the left has been its derision of the notions of individual freedom and of independent, independent thought. A pox on both their fucking houses. Will that do? I hope that the exploration I undertake while writing this book will stumble towards some kind of doubt. I have abandoned my belief in certainty. The only answers I desire now are those cast in doubt. That is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for reading that. Um, and also for articulating that because um, for me, uh, over the last few years, maybe even the last five or six years, I have been struggling with the idea that people become more and more certain of things. And, you know, as soon as, as soon as something, uh, an idea is raised, people feel like they have to take a side, they have to take a camp, that they have to fight for or against any idea, how big or how small, it doesn't matter. And I wonder if that was um, that, that, that need for uncertainty that I have been feeling lately is the thing that kind of led you to write this book. Chrissy, I think that's it. absolutely, you in, in, in know, I can give you a one word answer, but to make sense of it, you know, this is a book about what it means to be a fiction writer. I'm also, you know, I'm a film reviewer. I, I write nonfiction. I, I, I write essays, but predominantly what I do is write fiction. So what is the space for fiction? You and I, because we love each other, we've had these conversations of what it means to be a fiction writer in the world at this moment with a lot of questions about authority and, and legitimacy, et cetera. Um, but it seems to me that if there is a function for fiction, 
oh, it's not even a function is the wrong word. It's if there is a joy in fiction and a place and a love that we have for fiction, doubt is where the, the strength comes from, you know, where the, you want to, from the, from the get-go, the novels I've loved, the stories I've loved, the, the films I've loved have, have upset my expectations, you know, have made me walk in the shoes of characters that I might a ball. I love that when fiction does that. I actually do love that. It terrifies me and it angers me, but I love it as a, as a reader. And, and I think that is uh, an important, wonderful power of fiction. Um, it, there is an element to where your last book casts a long shadow. Mm. So the, the last book I wrote was called Damascus and it was about the the, the early church and it was a really I mean it took a long time to write that book and to think through that book whatever you think of it um, the most important lesson that I, I got from Damascus was how central doubt is it took a few drafts to understand how that was pivotal in the and I've got to thank Jane Paul for 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 that insight but how pivotal that notion of doubt is and that doubt has stood me in good ground not only as the writer Christos Chalkas, but the person Christos Chalkas, you know, but... Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful thing, the, the idea that, um, you know, the, the idea that we can live in doubt and that we can um, live without um, taking a side, you know, that we can actually live with all of the complications and messiness of the world is um, it's something that's, you know, it's not for the faint-hearted, really. No, no, and look, I, the, the, the living in, um, I, I mean, I think so much of culture at the moment is either or, and the, the really, the, probably one of the lessons uh, that I'm talking about with the writing of Damascus and, 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 and then the freedom that came from writing this book is, I understand the importance of something called faith, right, or, you know, and you know, I just did, I, I read that opening, it's a declaration of what the writer doesn't want to do. Um, and I think some people might think that that means seven and a half is denuded of all politics. I don't think it is, but they're not the capitalised categories. I think it comes out in softer, more, I hope, more, more questioning ways. I think it's, um, it it's actually one of the, the joys of this book is seeing you say, I'm not going to write about these things that you then write about for the rest of the book. Yeah. <laughs> like one of the things was every time you said you weren't going to write about something and then like two or three pages later, you would be writing about politics or you'd be writing about sexuality. And it made me chuckle because um, again, there's that, there's that doubt. You, even if you want to say, I strongly am not going to do this, you as the writer can't help yourself, but immerse yourself in those categories. I mean, there is something, you know, I'm very conscious of the beauty of the painting that we see only a glimpse behind you, Chrissy. And I, I want, I've, I've been setting my computer here because that's a lovely painting behind, behind me that we have in our house by an artist, Robin Astley, who, who I adore. And sometimes, and I've got lots of friends who are musicians, and sometimes I just think, Oh, I just wish I could play in that way and not have to be mired in words because words force you to statements to, you know, and the, the and I love words. Oh my God, that's my craft. That's why I fell in, in love with reading really early on because I love words. But that doubt that I'm talking about, it extends to, to language itself <laughs> and just being, just, you know, being conscious of how precarious words are, that the, the meanings that, that, that words have and that, God, surety, I, sometimes I envy people with surety, right? <laughs> I just think that, that's astonishing. But most often I'm scared of it mm. because it means that we can't propel conversations forward. We can't stop, I don't, I don't know, that's part of what I wanted to understand about the beautiful is to stop and say, okay, we disagree about these things. Let's just share something that we are witness to in 
you know, in this moment, in, in this period of time, in this, and just, uh, yeah. I, think well, that, I suppose the, the, the title of the book kind of leads us um, playfully towards the film, um, Eight and a Half. Can you talk a little bit about the title, Seven and a Half, and its relationship, the relationship of this book to um, the Fellini film? Oh, yeah, look, I mean, I, the Fellini film is wondrous. Um, a lot of people will, will know that who are, who are, who are listening in. Uh, it, it, he made it in the, the middle 60s, uh, and Marcello Mastorani plays uh, uh, the filmmaker, really. It's his alter ego, who has had some success. He's been working on films. This is going to be his ninth film, hence Eight and a Half. And he doesn't, he has to remind himself of why did he want to make films in the first place? What is it that he loved about filmmaking in the first place? And I think seven and a half, it just, when I began, you know, that, 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 that first early idea comes from my love for the Fellini film. And I hadn't seen it for quite a long time and then watched it again. And I just, I just thought, that's going to be an inspiration for, for what I want to do. I mean, I, I have to explain, Chrissy, that I was, I was working on another project called Resentment. Um, the idea of it was that I was going to write about uh, siblings who didn't, who, who didn't necessarily all agree. And it was trying to make sense of contemporary culture and the arguments we have in contemporary culture and the frictions. But it was going nowhere. It was like dead language. <laughs> You know, I couldn't, I couldn't get animated by it. And then uh, I saw the Fellini film. Then Wayne and I, my partner and I, we went away to uh, the UK in early March. And I can date these because they're so in me. That, that, you know, I'll never forget these dates, I don't think. This is 2020, of course. This is 2020. So March the, uh, the 10th, we land in London. Uh, I've got a week of work. Uh, and then we, we've... We've hired a car in Glasgow and we're going to take a month off to celebrate our 35th anniversary. And I kid you not, within that week is where the world changed. So on a Sunday night, we're met with friends, we're out, we're hugging, we're kissing, we're embracing, we're drinking into the night. Within a week, I wake up Wayne one morning, we're in Scotland, and I say, we have to get home. There's something going on in the world. We were really lucky. We got a, a flight back because we booked with a travel agent. We were really lucky because hotel quarantine hadn't started yet. And then uh, got back on the 19th of March. On the 21st, the morning of the 21st, I woke up and started writing seven and a half. And uh, so the, the idea was just this little germ, right? Just, you know, kind of the, the thinking about the film, thinking about why my novel wasn't working thinking, what is it that I want to write? Should I write? Who is, you know, what is the point of writing, to be really honest? And I set myself the, the task of, you know, as we all do, uh, I just remember saying 800 words a day, at least, on this novel. And it was astounding that I would get up every morning excited to write. <laughs> and I think, wow. That, that would have been a bit of a, a difference between the last book, which was really hard. Like I imagine Damascus would have been a lot of work. It was a lot. It was five years' work. And it was, uh, uh, you know, that was, that was digging in the earth, you know. To, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm not a sculptor, so I can only go by observing friends who sculpt. It's that... Damascus felt like that hard work of moulding, of moulding, of shaping, of shaping. It took, and then sometimes having to just make it crumble to the ground and start again because it took a long, long time. Uh, whereas this felt, yeah, it felt truly like it, fly, it flew from my, from my hands in, in a way because I, I think the, all those thoughts that have been there about doubt, all those thoughts that have been there about beauty, all those thoughts that have been there about writing, all those th thoughts by creating the character that was me but not quite me, it allowed me a freedom to, 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 to write them without being didactic, without being 
um, without having in a way to choose sides, which is what I was doing in the novel. And I didn't like that in the novel. Um, it was, yeah, that was that was the experience of writing Seven and a Half. And uh, sorry, Chrissy, I'm just, just, no, uh, no, just no, thinking no. about that period too. And, and your, your question about Fellini's Eight and a Half, which is such a beautiful movie, uh, is the opportunity to immerse myself in works of art that I love. <laughs> um, that, that was another joy really to be able to, to think through what is it? What is it that I'm responding, in, responding to in great fiction? What is it that I'm responding to in a great painting? What is it that I'm responding to in a piece of music? What is different from the craft of painting to that of filmmaking, to that of writing? Yeah. And what is it that you're responding to in a great porn, porno? <laughs> 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 so let's let's talk. About, <laughs> look, you know, we're like, we're talking about great art, we cannot um, necessarily only talk about the highbrow. And I think that's the thing about this book is that it doesn't it doesn't um, make those judgments that we normally are forced to make in real life. You know, one of the one of the heretical thoughts is to say, actually, you know, I have been. As you know, I've been a consumer of porn from very, very young, I realize, you know, and also, and so troubled and excited and questioning about that relationship, uh, all you know, for years and years and years. We're talking decades now, but and then alongside that is uh, a debt, a huge debt I owe to works of writing and of film that were once seen as pornographic and shunned or ignored or damned. Um, I start with a quote from Genet in the, in the novel. And he was, you know, he was fearless and in talking about the erotic and the pornographic and then, and actually blowing that distinction. And so, we might be careful about our words, our choice of words here. <laughs> I, will, I will, yeah. <laughs> I, so uh, one of the things that, because I'm, I'm conscious a lot of people won't know the book because it's just been released. So this writer, Christos, goes away to write a book. He's not quite sure what the book is. Maybe he'll write a memoir based on his experiences as a young kid growing up. Uh, the erotic is there in, that, in those in, in those stories he wants to tell as a, uh, as a child of uh, working class migrants in inner city Melbourne, it, it, those early memoirs begin with sense, the, the sensual, with smell, with touch, with, with the, 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 the scent of, of sweat, you know, of colognes and the body. But he also has been for a long time, and this is biography, has been thinking about a film he wanted to make called Sweet Thing, which is about a porn actor who worked in gay porn in the 90s who's bisexual, he's married to a woman he loves, Jenna. They have a son who they adore. They live in Northern New South Wales. Uh, and his name is Paul Carrigan, which is the name of a porn actor that I was obsessed with in the 90s. And I did, I, I, I'd actually thought about, I started a screenplay, I started a theatre play, I started a short story. I've been obsessing about Sweet Thing for a long time. And I, you know, I think at some point over the last few years, and maybe at the point of writing Damascus, which has to do with going into my 50s, I realised I'm not going to be a filmmaker. You know, at the, I actually don't think I have that set of skills. That you Despite need. the fact that you've just had a feature film open at the Brisbane International Film Festival. I'm a writer. I will write for film. Yeah, I'm a, I, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it, to actually be a director is a different thing. Uh, and and so seven and a half is a book in which sweet thing found its place, and it's found its place by me being able to declare both a love for this porn actor and also for the love of film. And going pornography is part of that love I have for cinema and the movie image, and I'm not going to make it. You know, I'm not going to separate it. I'm just I'm going to. Uh, try and understand it. One of the things of my relationship to pornography is that it is, you know, you're dealing with a, 
a world that is there, you know, close to, to immense suffering as well. You can't, you know, thinking through the, the nature of the pornographic industry. And are you, you know, the, at the outset, I said I'm, Seven and a Half is going to be a novel about beauty, but I know beauty is just not the, is not prettiness. It's something else. And there is a real danger and risk and struggle and suffering in beauty. And I, you know, there, there is a descent into Hades and I'll call it Hades. I won't call it hell. I'll call it Hades that happens uh, for the writer who is Christos, but most importantly for the character who is Paul. And that was my way of saying, if I am going to understand how important the erotic is for me, how important sex is for me, how important beauty is for me, how important love is for me, I have to be brave enough to face that darkness, that underworld. Because that's where so much of I look at the painting behind you. Mm. That's, that's where our inspiration comes from. Yes, it's that there, there is, um, I think we even talk, I think there's a quote from the book where you talk about the line between the grotesque and the beautiful. And you talk about the two things coexisting, um, like hand in hand, that um, they can't, there can't be one without the other almost. Um, is that something that you truly believe in real life, that there has to be, that the grotesque is also a part of beauty? Oh, I, I believe the, I think the, def, I have found absolute awe, I'll use that word, in, in the grotesque and the ugly. You know, we're talking about what is it, some, you know, the, those novels that you read as a young person and you may, you may shiver from what they're doing to you. Um, I'm thinking of someone like the great French writer, Celine, and, and Journey to the End of the Night, which made me, it shocked me. It, it truly shocked me because there's real ugliness, really a portrayal of what humans will do to each other in that. But it's also, God, it made me think of how I can write, <laughs> how, I can, how I can make sense of some of that and create something beautiful from it, <laughs> you know. I th Sorry for interrupting. I think one of the themes, and this connects to the family stuff in, in Seven and a Half, I, you know, so I'm going back to my childhood, which was, you know, ostensibly you could say it was a hard life because, you know, it's uh, the migrant world in the 70s. Uh, my parents were factory workers. But I had a kind of circle around me from family. And when I say family, I'm not only talking about mum and dad and my, um, you know, blood uncles and aunts. I'm talking about all the adults. There was a, a circle that Paul doesn't have that. So he, he hasn't, he's missed out on, on that. And then it, when I come out of the darkness of, of the sweet thing, I talk about the evil eye, that my dad knew how to protect us from the evil eye. And people would come around to our house in Richmond and in Melbourne and, and ask dad to get rid of, rid of the evil eye. And it sounds, there's no way, you know, in the world of Zoom, in the digital world, in the secular 21st century, of course, it's an absurdity, but I feel like those forms of intuition about that there are dangers and risk and evil is good to know, is, is, is something that I'm glad I, I have. And when it comes to your question, and I know I'm going round, but this is your question, in terms of I can absolutely find the beautiful in the grotesque, because often the grotesque simply means the things that have been deemed not beautiful or correct. Or, but I also have these gifts that I've got to kind of protect myself. So I can, you know, and, and one of the gifts in the book is dedicated to my partner, Wayne, is, is, is that safety, that, 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 that. But I can, it's like, if, you, if you're talking about the descent into the underworld, I've actually got, um, like Hansel and Gretel, I know my way home. Yeah. Does that's... that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And I'll come back to Wayne and um, Simon um, in a minute. But um, what a... <laughs> 
What I'd like to move on to is you've, you've touched on it, the idea of eros and the idea of how important eros was to your um, exploration of beauty. And like one of the things about this book is that it is soaked in the bodily, um, the bodily, the embodiment of eroticism, I suppose, in terms of there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of armpit. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of crotch going on in this book, to put it to put it mildly. Um, and I wondered um, what your um, thoughts on the relationship between the body and your writing the body in this book and beauty, because the way you write the body, it certainly kind of is not in the way that some other people might describe beautiful bodies. Yours is definitely um, a visceral kind of uh, meaty kind of bodily book. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, um, I think I think really early on, I realised that you know learning your craft of writing is really hard. You know that, Chrissy, kind of getting it, you know getting to understand how to use language, how to use words, how to convey sensations and ideas. And we have five senses. And I realised that, and I, I, even back to the loaded days, my first novel, that is there a way of writing all the senses? Because that's how we are in our bodies and how we are in relationship to each other as bodies. So uh, I, I think that what you just, I guess, call a visceral quality is being part of my writing from the get-go, I think. Um, in terms of the erotic and, you know, so of course I'm crafting a book. So I'm telling, uh, you know, I'm creating a narrative to what are very mixed sensations and, and desires you have from really young. But the, the young, the story of the young boy Christos uh, his first sensations of the world he describes are in a church. And part of it is the incense and the, the smell of the candles burning, but part of it is the sweat uh, mixed with the cologne, the, the sweat mixed with the perfume on the women. That's his opening to the, to the sensual, which, is what, which then leads on to the, the erotic. And, you know, the... The, the, I was in the writing of Seven and a Half, and this probably felt the most, I don't want to, just want to be careful. No, no, it felt the most dangerous, but really in the same sense, most important part of writing this novel is to, I know, as I hope I've explained before, I know the danger in the erotic. I know the... Uh, the, 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 you know, how can you not be alive in this moment in this world and not know what has, you know, the, the, the dark side of sex, the, 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 the violence, the misogyny, all those things that can occur in sexual relationships. But I also worry that there has been a disavowal of what is possible and exciting and transformative and for someone like me, liberating in sex and the erotic. And I wanted to write about it. So, you know, uh, uh, and I am... 56 now and I still remember you know this man who uh, shared the room you know shared the house we grew up in and he would come home from work and he worked in a factory did really hard work and I would rush up to him and I'm just a little boy and I would put my face into his armpits because I loved that smell and that smell that experience led me to a curiosity about the erotic that has taken me through strange paths and sometimes difficult paths, of course, but it's it's been incredibly liberating as well. And I wanted to give voice to that. To, to um, and there's an element of the novel which is a thank you to a man like Stavros, to a man like Nico, uh, to to my mum and to my dad for for making the sensual world a side of imagination and possibility for me. Just, yeah. there's a um there's a certain like there's a certain masculinity 
to the beauty in this book as well, which is really interesting. I mean, you and I are not going to go out cruising for the same guys. I can tell you that. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> we are not going to try and pick up the same people um, because there's, well, there's that's good to know. <laughs> so we, can, we can do this. We can go out. Um, there's there's certainly like your the kind of the the um, preoccupations of the book are with a very um, masculine. If like if we're going to talk about the binaries, you know, it's yeah. kind of it's toned right down to the masculine end of things which is really which interested me I was actually fascinated by um the way you discovered the beauty in those kind of very hyper masculine when um you know a, a lot of people are quite um troubled by hyper masculinity these days as well and yet you were able to kind of immerse yourself in that and find um the beauty and the the eros in hyper masculinity uh, yes, I mean, I think that someone actually just this morning, Chrissy, a friend said something they just read seven and a half. And I, I was really struck by it because I hadn't thought about it. And he had said he feels like he's read Ari, who is the, the main character in Loaded, now. Um, that, that there is a sense of, and, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I, I'm just really glad he's found a certain peace. Yeah, right. I would not yeah. have thought he he would have would have if you you know going back to that novel. Uh, again, yes, uh, it's a difficult question to answer simply. So I'm really I really actually want I'll hold let, hold me to this that when we we are together we can have a really big conversation about this. There's something about the relationship between sexuality and masculinity femininity as well and class mm. that is um, uh, is important to my relationship to to that physical world you know um, I I could and, and I think I have at part you know times written novels that are looking at the destructiveness of the masculine um, you know the, the moment in Barracuda, where the main character commits a heinous act of violence. You know, I understand that. In this book, I was looking the 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 the, the, the real suffering, the ugliness is, is about poverty and what Paul discovers when he goes back home to America. You know, that, that, uh, whereas in this book, I was wanting to be thankful to something about those working class migrant who gave me an understanding and a first kind of safety and uh, curiosity about the world. And they were, you know, they, they, were, they were macho, and sometimes offensively so, but they were also surprisingly gentle. And they were uh, prejudiced and bigoted in many, so many ways, but they're also, so many of them were adamant that they were going to keep loving me even when I came out as a you know as a as a, as a, as a young queer all those years ago it's it's I think that is what really struck me about my friend's comment about the relationship between loaded and seven mm. but there's something about the trajectory of sexuality there that he's yeah. glad to read and there's something you know Freud would um like to unpack um you know that again it's the the you in the fiction the the, the biography in the fiction and the fiction in the um, memoir really it's the kind of the dual kind of things with both the fictional book and this book which is you know pretending to be memoir at times yes. um, which is interesting but it's also interesting that you you just talked about um you just talked about class and you talked about how um with your reading at the beginning from the book you were going to write a book that was completely devoid of all these political things and yet it's so fundamentally a political book this one um that uh i i found it i found it quite fun uh for you to be constantly saying i'm not going to write this kind of book and then to exactly write the kind of book that you're suggesting you're not writing chrissy i love you thanks for getting it <laughs> i mean because that's that you know, I knew, you know, that, that there's a tongue-in-cheekness there about the book. Not that it, there's also a, there is also a seriousness in, 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 in some of those doubts I have about the, what politics is, what I call the capital P politics, the, the refusal to countenance nuance, to uh, um, uh, the 
the kind of lack of charity. I, I know that's that's a word that's been so overly determined by, by by Christianity, but I mean it in its its in its sense of love, like or a grace that you give to someone that you don't assume the worst. You know, now I'm not an idiot. Someone smacks me in the face, so you know I'm going to be wary, but. The assumption of the worst. I felt that was becoming so virulent in 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 the culture, and and I didn't. So that's there's a truth there, um, and also my, you know, it's it is really it goes back right to the beginnings of of my work. A real questioning of faith, be it religion, but also be it political, because of the damage that political faith has done as well and I think where it's all connected you know with family you know is and I, I didn't know this was when, when I was young but I god it's been I'm so glad of it now that mum and dad were this is Greek politics you know she came from a communist family he came from an anti-communist family so argument debate questioning sometimes quite fierce arguments was there like I, I just I just remember falling asleep under the kitchen table while around me, adults, women and men, and that's important to say, were, you know, mum's not shy about, you know, about declaring her politics, were, were talking about the world and how they perceived it. And I learned so much from it, but I also learned that they eat, you know, there wasn't, the world was not good guys and bad guys. Yeah, it was much more complicated that, and that there was. And they so, could live together. They could yeah, live yeah, still yeah. disagree, which is an yeah. interesting point to make. Um, I'm I'm going to come back to that idea of auto fiction, I suppose you call it, and I know that you've probably um tried to squirm away from that title, but that really is that that's the word for what you're doing. You're doing um you know autobiography, which um has fictional elements so Christos in the book is you but Christos in the book is not you yeah. as well simultaneously um, and I'm really interested in the idea that Christos in the book has a, a loving partner of many years um, called Simon uh, and I'm fascinated to know how you negotiated that line uh, with Wayne your partner of 35 36 years now um, how like do you because you are implicating yourself in this fictional yeah not fiction, non-fiction world, and you're playing with the audience to say, guess which bits are real and which bits are, are fanciful, but um, you're also implicating Wayne in that um, game as well. Did you have to run that by him or? I've been, I've been um, Chrissy, so fortunate uh, in this, in the generosity of, of uh, of, of being with Wayne in, in, in the relationship. So, uh, you know, he's, this copy is his that I've got, that I was reading from, and he's reading it again. He's bloody read every draft. <laughs> like, he doesn't want to read it. But we, there was a period between lockdowns in, in Melbourne where we did go up to the South Coast. And I had let, you know, I can't be accurate, but maybe somewhere in the vicinity of 30,000 words on this novel resentment that was going nowhere and I had about 22 23 24,000 of seven and a half and he said he said can I read them both and because I was I was really unsure you know should I keep persevering with this this book that didn't, I didn't seem to make work but maybe there was something in it and he read them and he just said you, you got to go with seven and a half this is and he said, this is the one that flies. <laughs> you know, this is the, the one that soars. And that I thought uh, it, it, it's astonishing to, you know, because uh, he's not, he's not going to tell me that just because I want to hear it. You know, he can be, he, he, he you know, he, he's really ruthless sometimes after every first draft, just going, you know, this is what's not working. Or, but this, it, it, and I, I remember, you know, having a conversation about how much I was revealing in it. And I mean, I think Wayne's been used to that for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. There's, That's also, there's also family kind of um, and related people who are implicated in this story as well, I suppose, who might people in your um, your 
childhood life who may recognize themselves if they ever read the book as well. One of the people I think in the in, in the acknowledgements is my cousin um, uh, Vicky Chiandafilu, who's she's like my sister. We we actually grew up in Richmond together, which is a in a city suburb that um, of Melbourne. Uh, she, she's like, yeah, she's like my sister. And she, she read um, a, a really early draft of Seven and a Half after, yeah, after I finished that first draft in October 2020. And because Vicky knows these people, I kind of, that, that was really good to, in a way, to hear her say, look, I don't, there's, not, there's not a problem here. I think because I wasn't, I mean, I think there is, as Genet says, I think there's cruelty in the novel, particularly, you know, in some of the descent into Hades. But I don't think there's cruelty towards any of those people. No, no, there's definitely a love for all of yeah. those people, yeah. which is okay. which is nice actually, which is a lovely, a lovely touch. And I don't think you could write anything other than that because of who you are, to be honest. Oh, um, okay. so Chris, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's you know to the question of why you know Wayne is Simon in the book it, that came really early on because um, Stavros is not the name of the, the, the guy who lived with us. Uh, Nico is not the name of the uncle that um, I, I had that masturbatory experience. You know, at the beach, it, I, um, uh, I I wanted to be really conscious of not using their names because that you know just to give them some protection from, mm. the, from the world <laughs> I've made my decision to be in this world they haven't you know they haven't yeah no been... that's probably probably wise to be honest that's good um there's there's also I'm aware of the time I'm going to open up to questions very soon but um there's a question in the book uh, which is is writing today safe and bloodless um you you talk about um that writing today is often safe and bloodless, uh, which really struck me. Um, and that could be you uh, musing or it could be Christos the writer musing. I'm not sure whether that's the fictional writer or you musing about, um, about work that comes out today. And I wondered if um, that was how you felt about a lot of the work that was being produced. Um, and if so, is there any blooded work that you could point to? for us any any work that has blood that has teeth ah, look, you know i'm of course there is uh, uh uh in terms of the question it is the play between the christos of seven and a half and the christos who is me uh i mean i you know just sort of I, I, I was really i loved emily biddo's new book wild abandon that that's full of that's full of the body you know oh, the, yeah, um, you know, that, that there is, uh, of, of course there is, um, uh, I, I was so excited about the promise winning the, the book every other night, because not only because he's one of the loveliest souls in the writing world, but it's also uh, magnificent. Um, so don't, uh, you know. Um, so there is, there is work oh, out there, it uh, was, yeah. Pio's um, Heidi that came out this year and, and you know, I, I, I could just make a list, but what I will say, and this does concern me, and this is where the caution, you know, I worry that a lot of us, and I'm including myself, and I'm, I'm including you, including everyone, is there's a little bit of looking over the shoulder of what, what will people say? And I distrust that fear because it feels, it's not coming from a space of genuine, oh, sometimes it is, maybe, you know, I've got to be conscious of generalizations, but I do distrust that fear. And I distrust it because one, it means we can't fail and make mistakes. And I just think that is really not good for the work we do. Because you know, I've learned it's, it's through my some of my failures and mistakes that I can get to 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 to, to you know to good work, um, and and because I think of you know and I think because of what it seeds that we may not be conscious of things like resentment, you know that that envy, um, distrust, and I. That does concern me. I think that means that our plays, our films, our books 
are going to be compromised if we're looking over our shoulders. Mm. Yeah, but, mm. And so we're, we're doing it. I, mean, I don't think that is, that, that, that is true. <laughs> Did you, did you feel that once you'd finished this book and handed it in, did you feel a little bit of that, I was doing this um, bravely and yet now I'm a little bit worried about what's, you know? No, no I mean, I, probably more people around me than myself. I don't, you know, I don't, I, 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 you know, you're never going to be able to look over everybody's shoulder and go, no, no, this isn't what I meant or, you know, uh, a friend, another friend the other day reading it said, you know, you're going to be careful because uh, we don't like our politics not being spelled out for us. <laughs> and I mean, I, I don't think that's the function of a fiction writer anyway. Um, no, I didn't, I wasn't concerned about that. I think there is a real protection in not being on social media, Chrissy. I think there's a real, uh, because when you do end up having the argument and debate is face to face, it's um, there's and in face to face there's a space for actual true argument in their sense um, and and people people aren't as vicious mm. across the table from yeah no that's actually really good advice sage advice Christos I'm going to open it up to oh. <laughs> Grandpa Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she gets off Twitter immediately. Um, I'm going to open up to questions now. I have 20 more of my own, but Yana, are there questions from the audience? Yes, we've had a few come in. Um, I'll start off with um, Ian's question. Ian says, over the years, I have appreciated your voice as a gay writer in the way that as queer readers, we are always looking for stories when we are not a part of the central narrative. How do you feel about the influence or responsibility of documenting a maturing queer voice or dialogue? Oh, uh, probably uh, the, the heretical thought and is, is around the, the notion of responsibility uh, uh, in that, that that can be quite a diff, <laughs> Quite contested about what your responsibility is, and that's uh, you know. Uh, let me give you an example. You know that when my first novel was published, uh, it was published uh, by Jane Paul Freeman, who who understood queer writing, but I had given it to uh, what was called back then a gay and lesbian press, and they said to me it's homophobic and racist because they were reading it in particular ways. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it's homophobic. I don't think it's racist. I think it is using a language that was contentious. And it came out in the 90s in a period where the politics of queer was queer as fuck. <laughs> there was a, I was influenced by, you know, I was by punk and a kind of energy and audaciousness and uh, in, in, in such a movement and in such music and in, in such art. Um, so the only way I can write is to just be all of myself in the writing I do. And in terms of a responsibility, whether it is as uh, speaking in the voice of a child of immigrants or whether it's speaking in the voice as a queer fellow or, or whatever position I speak from, there's a certain uh, that sense of responsibility is is there when I do essays and nonfiction, when I do film criticism, because I'm you know um, I, I don't I want you to trust the um, the thought that has gone into it, the that I'm not uh, playing with you in terms of my perspectives. But when it comes to fiction, I'm um, yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. There's something different at play, and I, so I don't feel it. I don't feel it as uh, I don't feel that responsibility. Um, I think if I can, if I can, as I said, if I can write all of myself in the work I do, mm. then that's the best thing I can do as a fiction writer. 
I will move on to a question from Brooke. They say, Christos, would you call this a hybrid novel? What are the strengths of writing semi-autobiographical piece of fiction? And were you inspired by people like Douglas Stewart? Uh, you know, um, no, not, no. I, I mean, I, really the, the inspiration was um, eight and a half. <laughs> And that's that's what led to to the title and led to the. I'm not being. I've, I've been trying to say this carefully. I'm not. I, you know, one of the great joys of writing Damascus was immersing myself in in philosophy and theology and and, and thought. I, you know, I realised how. I wish I'd been a better student. So I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm, hopefully you will understand. I'm not being anti-academic when I say this, but I wasn't. I wasn't even aware of some of these categories when I first started work on, on Seven and a Half. Uh, I think the notion, but there's something that you pick up in the ether, if you like, and because you have conversations as part of writing groups or you have it with friends or I, I meet Chrissy in Sydney and we're sitting down um, at, over breakfast and we're, we're talking about what's going on in the world and what's happening with writing. And so... I, it felt like there were so many questions about how do you write, the responsibility of, responsibility of writing, what is, uh, you know, the authority of a voice in writing. And I kind of, oh, the, there was almost a dare there and I thought, well, if I'm going to address it and why it wasn't working in the other novel I started was because I, I, I Christos Chalkless, wasn't in there. I was completely hiding from there, in there. That it felt like if I take if I deal with this head on and put Christos Chalkis in this book, that there may be something I can get to just for myself, but hopefully for, for, for readers as well, about what it means to write fiction in this day and age. Mm. You know? um, I actually had a question um, when you were talking about how migrant Greek men who came in the 70s to Australia. Um, and how they could be overly masculine, but with these moments or little glimmers of gentleness. And I was wondering, do you think that this is only true for Greeks of that era or men in general in the 70s? Or is this just a Greek male trait that kind of persists today? Look, I think, uh, you know, one of, it's funny because, you know, in terms of Chris's question of, did I think, I thought I was going to, you know, there's a, there's a line, it's a really simple line in the book that says, this is not an English book. And it comes after a moment where, where the narrator is, is talking about his desire for a younger man. Uh, so, I, you know, Yana, there is something I love. I just remember being a really young man and going to Greece and you know, coming from this world. This is the world I grew up with. And I would be with a, you know, you know I was used to women going, ah, oh, we love you, Christos, and hugging me all. Uh, but then this really big man, you know, quite, you know, stereotypically macho, just grabbing my face, pulling me to, towards him, kissing me on the lips and going, you're beautiful. It's in Levendis, you know, which I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't used to in, in, in that way. And I, I still find that a remarkable and beautiful aspect of the culture. I don't think it's just Greek. Uh, I think that across, across the world in different places, you find that, 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 that element. Um, you know, I, I don't want to, the danger there is you kind of romanticizing of, of difference that's not that's not I hope that's not what I'm doing I'm just saying that there is something about the erotic uh, and the sensual that comes from my heritage that I'm really glad for. Uh, mm. you know, the, the, um, you know one of the things that always they always you know when you talk to writers in in Greece and I've talked to writers in France who say this and you know writers in um, India, and they go, isn't it strange that the English are the only ones who have a, a, an award for bad sex? Yeah. They don't have writing or they don't have an award for bad writing on love or bad writing on family. Or, but it's, <laughs> it's this kind of fear of the, 
of the erotic. And I don't, you know, I, I love that sensuality that comes from that, that, the, the world I grew up in. I also grew up with misogyny and I grew up with homophobia and I grew up with racism. Uh, uh, that's the reality of the world. I like get that's the complicated thing about how we, you know, of how you hold all these things together. Mm. Hey, Christos, I'm going to wrestle this back for a second because I want to, before we go, I just really wanted to ask you, like you've, the, the pandemic is like a, a, a humming background noise to this book. Um, and I have been um, really wondering how writers of fiction in the future and contemporary fiction will deal with um, the pandemic. Do you feel that this has changed, the way the world has changed, has changed how you will approach fiction in the future? Do you feel like you have to write from a, a place where the world has changed as it has? You know, for me, Chrissy, I mean, I think there will, you know, uh, uh, we'll all be finding different ways to kind of understand the last two years. Um, I've, I've started something new um, and I know already, it's just a first draft, but I know already that uh, I've kind of set it post pandemic and realize now I'm going to see it through to a first draft, but that notion of the post pandemic is, it's going to be a, few years away <laughs> so yeah. of course it's going to affect the writing of the contemporary is going to be affected by what we've all experienced partly too because though its effects and its intensities and the political questions it raises are different depending on where in the world you are but well, actually this is something we're sharing it's made us more, like we've got borders in a way that I've never experienced in my life, right? I can't get, I can't be with you tonight. I, you know, I did never imagine that. So it's changed something about the relationship I feel to my space, even in this space. Um, so yeah, it's gonna take some time for me to work out how to write the, the contemporary. In a way, probably uh, uh, writing seven and a half was, one of the joys was that it's the nature of the book that the pandemic gives it its possibility of being, but it's not a book about the pandemic. You know? Yeah. yeah. But uh, how do you feel about it? Like, oh, I I'm wrestle with it every day and I'm just starting a new book at the moment and I realise I have to, I, I just have to look at it face on. I can't, I know that no one wants to read books about the pandemic at the moment, but I don't, I can't write fiction um, contemporary fiction without acknowledging it I can't uh, you know to uh, I was thinking because I had you know was with some friends and talking about this the other night that this is this is me uh, thinking about what was the last event of that sort of uh, global changing uh, uh, intensity and of course there's um, uh, what happened on 2001, September 11th in New York City and kind of because of the wars it led us into kind of this fractioning of the world and that how that played out in so much fiction and still does and, and, and writing. So, and the other one is the, uh, the end of the Cold War, mm. you know, which particularly because yeah. I love Eastern European writing and, and, and you know, I've been um, immersed in the writing of that world. But, you know, it takes years for yeah. sense of, of these events and these historic moments to comprehend them, like, you know, and we're not going to do it in 2022, I don't think. No. But, you know, you're either, as a writer of fiction of the moment, you're either going to have to go, I will have to deal with the pandemic and let, you know, knowing that in 10 years, people's memories may be fading <laughs> in the way sometimes we'll read a, you know, something about September 11 in a, in a, in a book and go, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, uh, that, I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying that that, that can happen. Changes, yep. You know, you, you have to write in your moment. Yep. Or you write history or you write future. Yeah, it's true. I could talk to you about this forever. In fact, we should actually get a panel where we get a bunch of writers together to discuss um, this because I think this is going to be 
the issue of the future. And I do believe that this book, which you've given us a gift, um, is not just a book for all readers, but a book particularly for writers, because it really does. It's, it's a great guide to how we actually think through things and put things together. It's a, it's a beautiful gift. Thank you, Christos. Oh, Chrissy, thank you, uh, and, and Jana, and everyone. Um, um, uh, I, I love you. Thank you. That, all right. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Chrissy, for your expert questioning, as always, and Christos. It's been amazing. Such an illuminating conversation, and I love chats like this where it feels like two friends catching up. I hope everyone else enjoyed as well. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.